turn on this uh, mic here? Hello? Hello? There we go. All right. Well, thank you. So uh, I'm going to tell you my uh, whole work life in the next few hours this morning. And so we'll have to compress things down a bit. Uh, I don't have any disclosures for this talk. Uh, I have been an unpaid participant in a number of trials. So we're going to start with a question here. And this uh, dovetails with what we did in the review session this morning. Which of the following is a contraindication to TPA for acute stroke? Is it hernia surgery six months ago? The patient woke up with a new hemiparesis 30 minutes ago. Blood pressure in the emergency department is 180 over 95. The patient had an upper GI bleed two years ago from subsequently treated peptic ulcer disease or had a cerebral aneurysm that was clipped five years ago. Which of these is a contraindication to giving TPA? Okay, well here's, I'm with the 26% uh, here. Someone who wakes up with a new hemiparesis shouldn't get TPA because you don't know how long ago the stroke actually occurred. And we'll come back to that in a minute. We've now extended the window out to four and a half hours for a large number of patients. Uh, but still, when somebody awakens, you don't know whether this happened right before they woke up or happened just when they went to sleep. Uh, there are perhaps some up-and-coming MR techniques to help us uh, with patients like this. But at the moment, you shouldn't treat anybody like this. So, uh, as we mentioned earlier this morning, admission to a stroke unit is actually the thing that produces the best improvement in the risk of death or dependency after an acute ischemic stroke. Uh, thrombolysis is also quite effective, but turns out that the effect size of stroke unit admission is even larger. Anticoagulation basically has no role in the first 48 hours uh, with the occasional exception of someone who has a TA or a minor stroke in the setting of atrial fibrillation or some other uh, potentially embolic condition which you're trying to prevent the next stroke. There's no role for heparin in the treatment of an acute stroke. Aspirin has a very slight effect size. You can see that the confidence intervals don't cross one. So it does favor treatment with aspirin in the setting of acute stroke. Uh, but this is a, a modest effect, and certainly nowhere near as important either as the stroke unit or thrombolysis. If we look at the different things that seem to affect the utility of thrombolysis, um, you can see that in different studies, uh, the average movement of the line toward the left is really quite substantial. This was the TPA trial itself, and it's important to recognize that not only was there an improvement in the people who had uh, the best outcomes, so had a very good NIH stroke scale, but we typically uh, focus on is the Rankin scale, which is a, a measure of functional abilities. You can see that the people who had normal or near normal function nine, or, sorry, 90 days after their stroke increased with TPA, uh, but the percentage in each of these groups is uh, moving toward the left. People are doing better. And in particular, the deaths did not increase. So even though there was a tenfold increase in the likelihood of a symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage, those patients are included in here. So deaths were actually lower, but not statistically significantly lower. And the percentage of patients with the best outcomes improved by about 30 percent. Uh, these guidelines came out in 2007. They're the most recent ones. We'll touch on a couple of points, but obviously if you're going to be involved in this, you want to have access to the guidelines uh, so that you have the most recent information on uh, the details of doing this. From the guidelines, this is a table looking at the characteristics of patients uh, in whom treatment should be considered. So you have a measurable deficit. You don't want to treat somebody who has really no deficit by the time you see them. There's nothing to treat, and you only run the risk that something bad will happen. They, so they shouldn't be clearing spontaneously. And they shouldn't be minor. Those are all ways of saying the same thing. The flip side is the major deficit issue. Now, there is no NIH stroke scale score at which treatment did not result in an improvement in outcome. 
uh, but the risk of hemorrhage is greater in people who have higher scores. You can see a, a large number of uh, potential things that might lead you to treat someone. These are basically taking the old exclusions and trying to turn them into inclusions. When we did this in the original trial, we treated a large number of patients. Uh, remember this morning we talked about a 10% bolus and the remainder of this dose over 60 minutes. There was a cap to the upper limit of the dose uh, based on weight. That wasn't done for any scientific reason. It was so that we didn't run out of study drug. So we don't actually know what to do with large people. Uh, we have stuck pretty well with a, a cap, uh, but you should understand that we don't really know that that's the right thing or not. There was no anticoagulation given, and we had a protocol for the management of blood pressure after the infusion began. Uh, so the main outcome was that the patients who were treated were at least 30% more likely to have minimal or no disability at 90 days. This tenfold ten increase in symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage, however, did not result in an increase in mortality or even a worsening in outcome. Um, by the way, this, I recently found my original investigator card proving that I had a license to kill. Now, if we look at the time from uh, stroke onset to the time of treatment, and this starts at 60 minutes, which is, in general, the fastest we've been able to get anybody treated because you'd have to have them there uh, very quickly in order to get scanned and worked up. If we look at the people who are treated very early, the odds ratio of improvement is nearly fourfold. As time goes on, that likelihood decreases. Um, this is showing that at three hours, there is still a positive benefit. If we added in some of the other studies, this was the major NINDS study, uh, that have looked now at the uh, extension of the treatment out to four and a half or so, uh, you can see that there is just going to be the point at which you cross the line for the median. So there are people who fall below the line, meaning that there are some people who are going to be harmed by the treatment. Uh, there's been an attempt to uh, sort of call those people out. If you look at the study here, this is the publication from the New England Journal, looking at the three to four and a half hour range, they didn't treat some of the patients that they thought were more at risk. So they didn't treat people over 80, they didn't treat diabetics, they didn't treat second strokes. So the people who are eligible in the three to four and a half hour range are a somewhat constricted group compared to the ones who were treated in the original NINDS trial. But again, the likelihood of good outcomes uh, is improved regardless of how bad you were off the start. So. Let's say that you are going to treat someone uh, or that you've already treated them. Now, what do you do with the blood pressure? Well, we wanted to keep the blood pressure to start with under 185 systolic or 110 diastolic. This study is old enough that when we started doing it, we were still taking blood pressures with a cuff and a stethoscope. Uh, so you have to remember that the numbers that you get from an automated system are likely going to be different we ought to have mean pressures here, but we've never gone back to figure out what they are. So we're still stuck with this. Notice that the, uh, the drug initial choice was labetalol. They did list nitropaste. This is really not something we want to give to this population of patients because uh, nitropaste, among other things, may produce a headache. And if somebody's exam worsens and they have a headache, we're going to assume that they have an intracerebral hemorrhage. Nitropaste and nitroprusside, as well as the nitroglycerin, will increase cerebral venous distension and actually increase ICP. That's a big deal in some of the other things we're going to talk about in this session. But in terms of stroke, when the patient first presents, there is no problem with intracranial pressure. So I can't say that there's a big deal in terms of uh, raising the ICP a little bit in the first several hours because the brain hasn't started to swell at that time. However, we don't want to have something that confounds us. So if labetalol isn't adequate, we'll go on to nicardipine. And if you can't keep the blood pressure down uh, 185 to 110, then don't give the TPA. Now, once you've given it, we want to have a somewhat lower threshold uh, so that there's a little bit of room here. So we try to get the diastolic, sorry, diastolic 105 or the systolic to 180. If the they creep above that in this, say, 180 to 230 range, more labetalol. Um, if they get higher than that after treatment, 
uh, we do want to treat this pretty aggressively. Now, the reason for this is that there's an association between the spike in blood pressure and the development of an intracerebral hemorrhage in the patients who've had thrombolysis, but we don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg. It may well be that a lot of these people had the spike in blood pressure because of their intracerebral hemorrhage. Nevertheless, we want to try and keep the blood pressure under control for the first 24 hours. Uh, this is also from the guidelines, characteristics of the patients. Uh, you notice that if they've been on an anticoagulant, the INR should be greater, less than or equal to 1.7. Uh, this was a very scientifically chosen number. Somebody made it up. We don't have the slightest idea what the actual answer is to that. Uh, but the guidelines say 1.7. And the, the guidelines still say no seizure. I, I think that's wrong, and I certainly have treated people who've had a seizure. Uh, but I want to have some evidence that they've actually had a stroke and that I'm not just looking at someone with a resolving residual weakness related to the seizure. So in the case I showed this morning, the trick was you could see fresh clot in the middle cerebral artery appropriate to the symptoms. Well, that's going to be a stroke. Uh, sometimes we'll go on to do MR imaging to look for restricted diffusion uh, in an area that we think is a likely stroke uh, in the patient who's had a seizure. But in general, if there's been a seizure, I want to work a little bit harder to be sure that I am dealing with a stroke. So now if you have someone who's had a stroke or a TIA, there are also a set of guidelines that came out in 2006 worth knowing about uh, and how to work up that person and how to treat them in the immediate uh, post-TIA or stroke period. I'm not going to really spend time on that this morning. You can look up a number of things that are important to know there. So let's say that somebody either has a contraindication to thrombolytic therapy or they have arrived uh, outside of the usual treatment window for intravenous therapy. There are other approaches. You can uh, do intraarterial thrombolytic therapy up to some period of time. We've done it up to eight hours or longer in the posterior circulation, uh, but now we're working with much less data. This is the original Mercy Retriever. Uh, basically, you would put this corkscrew into the clot via catheter and yank the clot out. People will do that for a longer period of time. This, by the way, as a device was approved for the removal of foreign bodies from a vessel. It was never actually approved as a stroke treatment. Right? Now we use it to treat strokes by pulling the clot out of the artery. Uh, but this is now getting out to usually longer periods of time or people in whom thrombolysis is likely to produce complications. Uh, there have been studies looking at the combination of intravenous followed by intraarterial uh, therapy, which at this point uh, people, I think, are still not certain what the role for this is. Uh, but we will go on to intraarterial therapy if someone has had intravenous treatment and hasn't responded to it. A few other things in the uh, more recent recommendations. Prophylaxis for a DVT is uh, clearly all right. When to start anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation patient, is, nobody knows. Uh, we do the aspirin within 48 hours. Uh, there has been in the past a notion that maybe some of the people will improve with augmentation of blood pressure. You don't want to lower the blood pressure except in the thrombolytic patients, and that just for the first 24 hours. But whether you could improve flow to areas that are ischemic but not infarcted by either raising the blood pressure or trying to improve cardiac output uh, has been studied modestly. I'd have to say that the most recent trial of blood pressure augmentation was stopped early for complications. So this is really a patient-by-patient -patient issue. Now here's something to remember if you're worried about giving TPA. So you give the stroke dose to someone who's not having a stroke and doesn't have some mass visible on a scan, there's less than a 1% chance that that person will have an intracerebral hemorrhage. Right, so this is six times lower than the likelihood that someone who had a stroke would have it. So if they don't have a big tumor and you treat them and it really was a postictal paresis or they were hypoglycemic or one of the other stroke mimics, the likelihood that anything bad will happen is very low. And I think that's important to keep in mind when you're trying to weigh what's going on. At what point can you start anticoagulation? Uh, well, unfractionated heparin within 24 hours. There is a slightly higher risk of hemorrhagic conversion in patients who are given an oxaparin, so we still stick to unfractionated heparin. Uh, we also start sequential compression devices. 
And again, there isn't the role for systemic anticoagulation to treat stroke. When you do it, it's because you're trying to prevent another stroke from an embolic source. Antiplatelet drugs, uh, aspirin is still the first choice. If someone has a breakthrough, you might consider aspirin plus dipyridamol. Not something we want to use in an acute stroke setting because the major side effect is headache, and it will confuse us again. Um, people who fail these typically go on to clopidogrel. As opposed to our cardiology colleagues, we typically give one or the other, but not both. Uh, the study that looked at this added aspirin to people who were already on clopidogrel and was unable to show any benefit. The exception to this is after an interventional procedure. They'll typically be on both for 30 days. Moving on to subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, I want to stress mostly the critical care issues, but uh, if, you, if you want to look this up in detail, last year there was a new set of guidelines put out from the Heart Association that's worth knowing about. Uh, if you see this scan, there isn't too much question about what's going on. There's lots of blood and there's hydrocephalus. But often when the patient comes in, it's not quite so uh, blatant as that. So you do see blood that's in the sulcine in the hemispheric fissure. The key to finding a subarachnoid hemorrhage is that the patient presents with a bad headache or they present in coma. It's not somebody who comes in with a new hemiparesis and no headache the way that an ischemic stroke is likely to be. We still rely on CT scanning as the major diagnostic technique. I think within a probably five-year period, now that we know how to do the MR sequences properly, if you can get an MR quickly, that'll probably be the test of choice for most of these patients, but right now we still do CT. Lumbar punctures are confined to people in whom the CT is normal or equivocal uh, as a way of trying to prove that there's bleeding. But remember, it takes about six hours for blood products to get down in the lumbar space. So if the headache started an hour ago and the CT is normal, doing the LP immediately isn't going to give you the answer. Uh, Angiography remains the way to prove where the aneurysm is and what to do about it. Um, depending on the ability of your hospital to do a CTA reliably, uh, you might do it by CTA. Uh, we still do conventional angiograms. If you do a conventional angiogram, of course, then the patient could get an intravascular therapy at the same time. Uh, about 20% of patients will have multiple aneurysms, so it's important to look for more than just the one you think bled. And about 15% uh, of patients will have subarachnoid hemorrhage without an aneurysm being detected. This is often hemorrhage around the, the midbrain, so-called perimesencephalic. Uh, in those patients, there is rarely a vascular abnormality found, and they tend to do well and tend not to recur. So whatever you're going to do, you want to get the aneurysm secured as quickly as possible to decrease the rebleeding risk. You want to have it done before you get to the fourth day when vasospasm becomes a risk. Uh, the patient who goes for open surgery will often get a huge dose of mannitol, so if you look at their electrolytes in the immediate post-op period, they may be quite screwed up. And microsurgical technique has really uh, revolutionized the ability to get to the aneurysm and do this, but in order to get the microscope in, they will have to dry out the brain with these huge doses of mannitol. Uh, endovascular treatment, uh, the chase between coiling and clipping is really more dependent on the ability of the operators to do it. Uh, there are some cases in which there clearly ought to be clipping, some in which there clearly ought to be coiling, and the prospective data that have been collected so far outside of those outliers suggests that we don't really know what the best treatment is. Increasingly, people are going to coiling because it seems to be easier to perform and can be done faster. This, by the way, is a coil. You might wonder how this thing that looks like a slinky is going to occlude an aneurysm. So here's a fairly large basilar tip aneurysm. This is the presumed bleeding site out at the tip there. And this is after packing it with a number of coils. The trick with the coil, obviously, is you don't want it to end up back in one of these other arteries because then you'll have the possibility for thrombosis within that artery. You'll see that on this angiogram, there's still a little bit of uh, contrast opacified blood getting into the aneurysm. It takes about 24 hours for it to clot completely. So the unsecured aneurysm can rebleed. If you don't do anything for the whole period of risk of vasospasm, over a quarter of those patients will rebleed. Rebleeding is fatal about 75% of the time, so you really want to prevent this from happening. <clears throat> 
Uh, if it's going to be a delay of a day or two before the aneurysm can be secured, then consider aminocaproic acid as a way to decrease bleeding risk. But you don't want to continue this into the period of risk for vasospasm because it worsens outcome in that setting. What should you do with the blood pressure? Uh, we think that you should keep the blood pressure relatively low until the aneurysm is secured. There's not actually data to back that up, but we think it makes sense. Um, we use usually labetalol to start with and then go on to nicardipine if that doesn't work. But once the aneurysm is secured, then let the blood pressure do whatever it wants. The patients have a lot of headaches, so analgesia is often difficult. Try to minimize sedation. You may have to sedate someone to keep them in synchrony with the ventilator if they need it. Uh, but the more you sedate them, the harder it is to examine them, and the more you're going to rely on ancillary techniques for the detection of complications. About 20% of patients will have symptomatic pulmonary edema, but a much larger percentage actually have an increased AA gradient. Uh, the mechanisms for this are several. Uh, there is a neurogenic stun myocardium that we've come to recognize with increasing frequency in these patients. They have the same uh, picture on echo or angiogram as the Takasubo cardiomyopathy and presumably the same mechanism in which the patient is getting a catecholamine surge and that that's what's producing the uh, problem is with the heart. But there is a purely neurogenic pulmonary edema that can occur in the absence of any cardiogenic problems as well. Uh, basically, these problems need treatment of whatever the underlying problem that triggered it would be. Uh, luckily, the neurogenic edema tends to clear up before the patients go into vasospasm. The things that cause vasospasm, uh, there are several candidates. Uh, a problem with nitric oxide and an increase in endothelin in the CSF are the leading candidates. And there are therapeutic trials that are aimed at these. Uh, we don't yet have good data to say whether these treatments will work. How should you diagnose vasospasm? It's really a clinical diagnosis, but don't wait for the patient to develop an aphasia or a hemiparesis. The first thing you see is typically that the patient develops decreased communication. They're just the so-called deer in the headlights. They're not speaking unless spoken to. They're just not interacting with the environment. Then their mental status worsens from there to become less responsive. Uh, they will occasionally present early on with focal findings, but we try to uh, get on top of them before those focal findings develop. A lot of people stress the use of transcranial Doppler. I'm actually not a fan of looking at the flow velocities in these arteries because if the velocity goes up, they may have asymptomatic spasm for which there is no recognized treatment. If, so if they're not having symptoms, I don't really care what the uh, velocities are. It is possible to detect it sooner electrophysiologically, but we have the same problem there. And without clinical change, I'm not going to do anything about it. The radiology shows you spasm. I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. Different ways to prophylax it. The only thing that is really recognized is the use of nimodipine, but that's really prophylaxis against ischemia. The vessel caliber doesn't change with nimodipine, but the likelihood of a stroke in people who go into spasm is less presumably a neuroprotective effect. Uh, we do various things to try and manage it. The volume expansion and the induction of hypertension is ways to try to improve flow through the uh, vessels that are stenotic or to improve collateral flow past them uh, are worth trying. However, moving on quickly to angioplasty, if it's a proximal vessel or an intraarterial vasodilator, I've listed papaverine here. I think people are increasingly moving to verapamil or nicardipine as the intraarterial vasodilator. Uh, these are more efficient treatments, but they have to be started early or else you'll fix the vessel, but you will be too late to fix the brain. So this was the picture on an initial angiogram. You can see that uh, several days later when the patient went into spasm, how much the caliber of that vessel has changed. Several of the other vessels are in moderate spasm. So we treat that usually with volume expansion, induced hypertension, and then intraarterial treatments. The development of hydrocephalus uh, augurs poorly for the outcomes of these patients. Uh, the management is basically to decrease the ventricular size. So here's a patient with a modest degree of hydrocephalus. Uh, because of the blood in the sulci, the sulci themselves are harder to see, but they're smaller than you'd expect for the size of these ventricles. Now, there are many thoughts about what causes this. Presumably, it's related to uh, 
blood that plugs up the arachnoid granulation so that the CSF isn't resorbed. It doesn't explain why the sulci don't enlarge as well. Uh, the patient who comes in with a severe headache in hydrocephalus or altered mental status in hydrocephalus deserves a reduction in the size of the ventricles. Uh, you might be able to do that with a lumbar puncture or putting in a lumbar drain. We typically do it with a ventriculostomy. Uh, there is not actually a head-to-head -head trial of doing it from above or below. Uh, so basically you're stuck with whatever your neurosurgical colleagues want to do. So here's our next question. Which of the following is the most likely cause of hyponatremia in a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Is it congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, associated polycystic kidney disease, SIADH or cerebral salt wasting. So go ahead and vote there. <laughs> All right, excellent. So yes, somebody could be volume overloaded by one of these first two mechanisms. Um, nothing about them predisposes to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Nobody voted for polycystic kidney disease. Um, almost always the patient who has polycystic kidney disease and aneurysm, the kidney disease is known before the aneurysm presents. These folks tend to present about 10 years sooner, so in their 40s rather than their 50s, uh, and they tend to present with higher grade hemorrhages, uh, but the kidney disease is really uncertain. So the real argument is between SIDH and cerebral salt wasting, and it is in fact possible for someone with a subarachnoid hemorrhage to have SIDH. But cerebral salt wasting uh, is the real problem in these folks. As I tell the house staff and students when they come through the unit, the way you learn to manage hyponatremia in this patient population is the exact opposite of what you do with everybody else. This is the one time in medicine when a low serum sodium usually means that you're salt depleted as opposed to being water overloaded. So. Normally, volume depletion is the major trigger for ADH release, and that's what's happening to the folks who have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They have a primary salt losing diathesis related to the excretion of atrial, atrial and other natriuretic factors. So they first get a volume loss that's isotonic, but then the hypothalamus responds by releasing ADH. Well, that, of course, makes them somewhat hypoosmolar, and you'd think, well, the hypoosmolality ought to shut off ADH production because now they're down here. The thing is that the hypothalamus sensing volume depletion, whether it's from bleeding or from this, overwhelms the ability of hypoosmolality to shut off ADH secretion. So they continue to produce ADH even though they're hypoosmolar. Uh, this is probably the key study in this. This is a group of patients who had subarachnoid hemorrhage, compared to a group of patients with brain tumors who are operated on the same day. <coughs> I mean, the urine output and the sodium excretion in the patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage is always higher than that of their neurosurgical controls and continues to go up for several days. So these people are putting out higher volumes and they're putting out a lot of salt in their urine. These are the only people I will diagnose as having cerebral salt wasting because you have to demonstrate that they're wasting salt is the reason that they're hypoosmolar. So I'm, I get worried when the patients start to be a negative fluid balance in the first day or two after they're clipping or coiling. Uh, but I don't do anything immediately. I wait until they start to show signs of hypoosmolality. But then you have to replete them with hypertonic saline. There is no other treatment that's going to work in this. Uh, moving on to a couple of other points. Should you use statins as a, a way of trying to improve outcome? Uh, Suffice it to say that there's a lot of argument on either side. There are a few small studies suggesting that statins improve outcome related to spasm. However, we did a large retrospective look in our patient population. Uh, basically half the patients before we started using statins routinely and half of them after, and there was no difference in outcome. Uh, there have been three other retrospective studies. They've all come to the same conclusion. There is a large prospective study going on in Europe now that hopefully will provide the actual answer to the question. About 6% of seizures of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage appear to seize at the time of their hemorrhage, but it's difficult by history to show that there's a difference between a convulsion and decerebrate posturing. So I think a lot of this 6% is an overestimate. 
seizures that will occur in about one and a half percent of these patients. Now, these are obvious clinically diagnosable seizures. There are more seizures visible with EEG monitoring, but we're not quite sure what to do about that yet. And always remember that these patients could be seizing for some other reason. So it had been popular to give prophylactic anticonvulsants. Uh, also, when you reperfuse somebody with an angioplasty, you may get uh, seizures uh, related to the improvement in blood flow. However, the group at Columbia, uh, and Andrew Natick moved on to Northwestern and repeated the study with the same results, showed retrospectively that exposure to phenantoin is associated with worse neuropsychological outcome. Uh, so almost everyone has gone away from using phenytoin in these patients. The question is, should you give them anything or should you give them something else? And I'll get back to anticonvulsants later this morning, but since the darling drug of ICUs now is levetiracetam, uh, people who do stuff give them levetiracetam. Whether that's the right answer or not, I'm not sure. Should you give magnesium sulfate? Uh, in this phase two trial, it appeared to improve the number of patients who had good outcomes. Uh, they didn't actually meet their primary outcome measure, which was a radiologic one. Uh, right now, there have been several smaller studies which are on either side of this question, uh, magnesium either appearing to be helpful or of no benefit. The large phase three trial in Europe is still in progress. Right now, I'm not giving magnesium except to replete it. Uh, there was a large study in head trauma patients that unexpectedly had to be terminated early because in this large study, the patients who received magnesium in the setting of head trauma actually had higher mortality and worse outcomes. So whereas I used to think, well, what could it hurt? I now think, well, maybe it could hurt, and I'm waiting for the results of the phase three trial. Uh, other things that predict spasm, well, if you're older, you're more likely to have spasm. If you come in with a worse grade, I'm sorry, younger, and development of hyperglycemia is a risk for spasm. Does that mean we should keep the blood sugar under tight control? Uh, there's a lot of argument here as to drops in brain glucose that are much worse than we expect from the lowering of blood sugar. I think most people are moving to a, a floor of 150 milligrams per deciliter in this patient population rather than using the Vandenberg uh, tight control. We don't really know the answer to that one. Um, the most promising new therapy is nitrite as a nitric oxide donor. It's unfortunately not been funded in humans yet because you can't patent nitrite. Uh, but if you get a really bad headache, eat a hot dog before you go to the hospital. Uh, should you transfuse people to improve their oxygen carrying capacity or should you bleed them the way we used to to decrease blood viscosity? And the answer to that is nobody knows. People who have higher hemoglobin levels tend to do better, but they're probably less sick in the first place and are having fewer interventions. So we don't really know what you ought to do with the hemoglobin, uh, and therefore we usually try to keep it closer to 10 rather than going down to the trick levels of transfusing around 7 or 8. Uh, but again, this is now going to be the subject of a randomized trial, a multicenter trial being run out of the University of Pennsylvania. And so in about five years, we'll know the answer to this question. I still tend to transfuse people when they fall below 10. Let's skip over that. So a few other things. QT prolongation is almost universal, but I've only seen one patient who developed torsade in this setting. Um, and the neurocardiogenic injury or the Takasubo cardiomyopathy we've already mentioned. This is something that's very uh, important and worthwhile to treat, however. Because although about 20% of these patients die before they reach attention, uh, 60 to 67% of them actually return to their premorbid level of functioning uh, if you follow them out to three or six months. So it's important not to lose hope in these folks, even the ones with the higher grades, uh, because often their improvements are quite delayed, but they're very substantial. And to me, this is one of the most rewarding groups to treat because of the good long-term outcome if I can get them through these initial complications. Uh, I don't have time really to talk about intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, there were a new set of guidelines that came out uh, last month in stroke or two months ago. So I think this was after your handouts had to be printed. But uh, if you look in stroke in 2010, uh, you can dig up these guidelines. Unfortunately, the guidelines are less evidence-based than their predecessors and more full of opinion. Uh, basically, the recombinant 
factor 7A did not show a clinical benefit, um, people will still say, well, I've got the subgroup that it will work in. That remains unproven. Uh, even if somebody's got a war for an overdose, it remains unproven that this makes any difference. So we basically restrict the use of factor 7 in these patients to folks who have really prolonged INRs and are going to need a ventriculostomy or some other surgical procedure. Uh, otherwise, we're not giving it. People are looking at prothrombin factor concentrates of various sorts. Should you lower the blood pressure? Uh, probably. How far should you lower it? We don't know. There is a randomized trial ongoing now uh, that will hopefully provide the answer to that. We don't know what, what to do based on data with pulmonary embolism prophylaxis. We start usually the next morning. Um, and just to finish up on that, it turns out that if patients get made DNR, that by itself in intracerebral hemorrhage is the kiss of death. And that the outcome of these folks, if they are aggressively managed, turns out to be much better than we thought it was going to be. Uh, and therefore, that doesn't mean that I keep supporting everybody forever. It does mean not to be quite as pessimistic as we have been in the past. As a neurologist, I was trained to tell the family that this is going to turn out poorly and you shouldn't do very much, and that it turns out to have been the wrong approach. So with that, I'm going to go on, I think, to my